This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, Lord Stanley's mug has been awarded, and that means it's time to shift our focus to the upcoming season. Once again, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're here to preview the entry draft. Uh, Matt, before we do that, though, if I would have told you that the team that was at one point during the season worse than Edmonton and at the bottom of the NHL was going to win the Cup, would you have thought I was crazy? Uh, I would have asked which team. And St. Louis, like when they were dead last, I remember on one of our shows shortly thereafter, I even said, I think that they are going to make the playoffs. And because it, it's one of those s- stretches for them where literally everything went wrong and the goalie screwed up, everything was disjointed. They fired their coach and just like everything that could have went wrong, went wrong. And you could tell that the players, though, talent-wise, were one of the better teams, and they sure put on a clinic after that point, and when we previewed the playoffs, we both expected St. Louis to come out of the uh, Central, and they did, and we thought we were going to face if them. If you but... remember at one point, I even said the Flames should maybe try to go for Allen, because I think the Blues would be in sales mode pretty yeah. soon. Uh, I remember, and I think that a lot of people were starting to look over the carcass that was St. Louis, and like, oh, maybe this guy's available, or that guy, and like uh, Schwartz, or uh, maybe even Shen, or something like that, and, but things came together for them, and I'm not entirely surprised that they won, and I'm glad that another team that hasn't won a cup before finally got one. Because I'd like to see just Vancouver and uh, Toronto with extended cup droughts. And, you know, so... Well, and that would mean, what, Vancouver's the only current team without a cup? Uh, Buffalo and Arizona are the the other right. two that yeah. are over 30 years old that haven't won one. Yeah, there's a few... I was going to say, there's a few teams in the league that don't have yeah. one. But yeah, it's and I think even with the Allen thing, not that he would come to Calgary, but if they have to give, uh, if they decide to give um, Bennington a big raise, I can see Allen being out of there, and I could even see him landing in Edmonton. Yeah, I could see that. I don't think they're going to want to pay two guys, you know, nine million dollars combined to ten. No, net. and I I would be somewhat shocked if Allen is on the team to start the year. Yeah, I agree. And I think that Bennington, I mean, even though it's one year, we know that guys tend to get paid based on one year. Yeah, especially a guy that, you know, wins you a Stanley Cup, you're going to get paid something. Like, even Ante Niemi, who was quite terrible, frankly, he ended up getting, like, nearly $5 million when that was a big amount of cap space. So... You know, I, I wouldn't... Well, even, I mean, we all remember when, like, you know, Hammond was good and he got paid. Like, it seems like if you can go on an extended playoff run, you get paid. Yeah, and it makes perfect sense because, you know, if that guy can repeat, then you've got an elite goaltender for a long time. It doesn't happen too often, but it, you know, it's better if you luck out and get one that's like that because now you've got a potential Hall of Fame caliber goaltender in your ranks and you don't have to address that issue from that point forward so it it well, it's good for st louis i'm glad that they have solved that problem for themselves and hopefully they don't take the nhl by storm next year and you know repeat we'll talk about it uh, probably in september but i think we're going to see some changes to the hierarchy of the western conference mm-hmm well, let's not talk about St. Louis. That's not why we're here. Uh, if people want that, there's a couple St. Louis Blues podcasts you can listen to. Let's talk Calgary Flames. And before we get to the reason we're here, the entry draft, some interesting Calgary Flames news came out this week. I think the, I don't know what you, the one that really I'm still scratching my head over, Spencer Fu has signed a KHL deal to play for the Kunlun Red Star, the KHL team in China, which also makes him eligible for the Chinese 
uh, Olympic team next time. This is a guy I know a lot of Flames fans, and you and I have talked to people even at the uh, the rookie camps, really high on this kid. Some people thought he should have been in the NHL already. I was never that uh, high on him, but kind of interesting to see him going to the KHL. I think probably for a guy like Fu, that probably spells, spells the end of him as a viable NHL prospect. What do you think? Uh, it depends on how well he does in the KHL. Like, if he's just a filler replacement level guy in the KHL, then he's basically over there to stay. But if he, you know, because if you look at it objectively, he's trying to get onto the Olympic team. So it makes sense that he would be not looked as a, at as a filler player who couldn't cut it in the AHL. Like it, he appears to have a specific goal and is going to attain that. And if he performs well in the KHL, then I'd expect him, some team to give him a contract afterwards. But if he's just there or bad, then, yeah, he's done for North American hockey. Yeah, I mean, he's 25 already, so that'll be his, uh, you know, it's probably 25. He, he turns 26 next May, so that'll be his 25-year-old season. I don't think he'll come back to the Flames. I think by the time you come back at 26 and you're competing for a job based on where this team's at, I think it'll be too far down on the depth chart. I believe the Flames will retain his rights as long as they give him at least a qualifying offer, even if he turns it down, which I can see them mm-hmm. doing. And, I mean, we're not going to trade a guy who's over in the KHL, but I think this is probably the end for Spencer Fu as a Flame, at least. Yeah, probably. But, you know, that, that I mean, happens you... every year, though, that... Some filler level, not quite NHL, but good AHL player leaves, and then you get a new guy in. And yeah, you know, we did sign a whole bunch of different European prospects, so it, like his role kind of has already been replaced. Well, you have to remember, it's not like this guy was a draft pick asset. This is a walk-on guy at uh, at one of our rookie camps a few years ago. I still think really guy brought in more just to fill a body because he was the best available. And if nothing else, we still know that we signed him over Edmonton. The kids from Edmonton still signed with the Flames. Um, And then today, another signing as we record this, the Calgary Flames announced that they've signed uh, Itu Tulola. He's their 2016 sixth round pick, number 156 overall. Right winger, 6'2", 21 years old. He's been playing in HPK of uh, the Finnish League. I think it's Finland. Um and he had 36 points in 60 games last year. So being that he's a 21-year-old, a guy that I think will will step right into a pro deal, it's a two-way contract. And I think right here, this is our replacement for Spencer yeah, Fu. Exactly. I think better upside than Fu has. Yeah, it's one of those where, you know, with losing Fu, it's not that the end of the world or anything so no i mean fans liked him but he's there's really not a lot to him i mean yeah he was he was yeah. here it's like are you gonna really miss kirby reichel like no nope. so yeah it's they're there and you know you just keep cycling in new people and hopefully one of them takes off yeah, and we see that at the AHL, right? It's like I've said to you before with NHL grinders. We get attached to guys like McGratton and guys like that, but it's just the face puncher, and you know they come and they go. Don't get too attached to them. And I think the same is true of AHL guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, until unless they well, start uh, stepping up, sort of like how like Dylan Dubé has this season or Mangiapane in past seasons. Like, unless they're elevating their stock in the AHL, if they're just stagnating, like, say, Curtis Lazar, then you kind of know the writing's on the wall that that's all they're basically going to be. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. I uh, I think I think there's some guys when they come in, you know right away that they're going to be AHL filler and be an NHL long shot or not. I still think you might see Lazar in the NHL. I don't know about here, but I think Lazar might get a chance somewhere, especially with another organization looking to field 25 more guys in a few years. Yeah, I can see that. Um, But we'll see. It's 
he's a guy who at least has been putting in the work. And I think there's a lot of GMs out there that are into that. You know, oh, this is a guy who wanted to go to the HL, wanted to get better. Yep. But, well, let's look into the entry draft. Uh, the entry draft coming up here in a few weeks from the time we record this. It's in Vancouver this year. So if any Flames fans are listening and want to take in an entry draft, uh, you can see if there's still tickets available. It's the 21st, 22nd of June. They always do the round one on Friday night and then the rest of the draft on Saturday. And I guess before we get to the draft, we should probably ask the big question that's been the question for Flames fans the last couple of years. We haven't drafted in the first round in a while, Matt. We've been trading away most of our picks for uh, veteran defensemen. As we remember, we made a big deal with draft picks for Hamilton and then a big deal with draft picks for Hamannick. This year, as we record this, the Calgary Flames do have their first round pick. Do you expect them to make that pick or do you expect them to deal that pick? I expect them to trade it. I, I would be somewhat surprised if they pick at number 26. That's not to say that I don't think that they'll be getting draft picks back in that trade, but I don't think that they'll just outright keep the pick. So do you think it's going to be like it was before where it's sort of a, a pick for a player, or do you think they would be like trading down? Well, looking at the quality of the players in this draft, uh, there's not really a huge difference from about 20 to 50. So... If the Flames felt that there was enough talent on the board that they could get two of the guys that they really like by trading down, I could see that. Um, I don't think it makes sense. Very, very similar to what we did the year that we did the Hamilton deal, and then the second year still got Shillington and Anderson. Yeah, or like uh, when the Flames traded uh, down from 14 to 21 to get Jankowski and uh, Sealoff, and... It's one of those things where the Flames, like, it, you know, sometimes the the team that gets the better pick gets the really good player. Other times, like Anaheim, they traded down and they got Raquel and Gibson for the draft pick from Toronto, which ended up uh, being Tyler Biggs, of all people. So, you know, it's one of those where if the Flames are confident in their scouting staff and they feel that they can get two top quality guys, I wouldn't be shocked if they, say, traded down to 30 or something like that to pick up a late second. But whether 26 or not, you think they will essentially keep that as a draft asset, whether they move down, you don't think they're going to trade like the first four uh, forward? Uh, uh it would depend on the forward. Like, if you're talking like a top six higher end top six forward like you know if the flames say wanted to get taylor hall then sure that you, that would be included but if you're say like the zucker trade no uh, that no so well let me so let me ask you the next question i was gonna ask then is do you see so you're expecting that uh first round pick to be made or I guess the first or, to be made with that first yeah, round pick. I would be somewhat surprised if they just stood on their laurels and just said 26 is where we're going to be and that's it. Uh, just due to the fact that the Flames don't have a huge amount of higher end prospects in the organization now because they've mostly graduated and this draft is rather deep in terms of the quality from about 20 on to about 50 to 60. Well, that's exactly why I think you have to keep it as a pick. They might not pick a 26, but I don't think you can afford this year to trade the first for another NHL player. No, it, it would just depend on the player specifically. Like, if it's a guy like Taylor Hall, then you go, well, yeah, we'd like to keep the prospect in, but, you know, it's also Taylor Hall. So, you know, and if you can sign him to a long-term contract, then your team's going to be a lot better than whatever that prospect would have been. It just, it depends. I mean, you and I talked last year at rookie camp about just how, how terrible the rookie camp was. Cause there was nobody there. Cause the flames haven't made any. Picks. Yeah, I know. And the only way that like, I personally don't like trading draft picks. Like it, you know, personally, my philosophy is get as many bullets in the gun that you can to, you know, take to the range to, go target shooting because if you hit the mark a few times then you know your team's a contender and so like i'm not 
overly thrilled with the prospect of trading draft picks in the first place, but everything, you know, like Calgary's more in contender mode. Like they did finish first in the West, second overall. So like if they can boost their team and it requires the first round pick to do so, then, you know, you don't like doing that because you're robbing from a couple years from now. But on the other hand, if it's a big enough upgrade, then we might do what St. Louis just did yesterday. So it's... I think we... I think we will see the Flames make a big deal on the draft I floor. Agree. I don't think I don't think you're going to see that round one pick move necessarily for an NHL asset though. I think if you look around the team with guys like Brody, guys like Gillies, maybe even a guy like Bennett, I think the Flames have enough other assets they could parlay into NHL talent. I agree. I think you're right. I think that they're not happy at number 26, but I can see them drafting at number 26. I can see them looking around saying the cost to move up doesn't make sense. No. Let's just keep 26. Yeah. And I wouldn't even be opposed to, like, say, trading down to, like, 32 if it ended up getting, like, a 45 or 50 overall pick or whatever. Well, what I what I tend to find in a draft like this one, though, is, but like you were saying, it's so deep from about, let's say, 20 to maybe 45, 50. I think teams are almost happy with almost anyone in there. And in those deep draft years, you often see less movement in the first couple rounds of trading up and down. Yeah, it just depends. Like, if you have one team who likes a specific guy, like, say, Spencer Knight, they really want a goaltender, and Spencer Knight is available at 26, then you might end up having a situation where, oh, okay, you know, and that might work. So, it... It's one of those where everything just depends, but and I don't think that the Flames would pick Spencer Knight if he ends up at twenty six. No. Like we need goaltending, but we don't need a to burn a first on one. So I'm gonna predict that the Flames make a big deal of the draft I agree. floor and trade and I think it's like I said, NHL assets or let's call them existing assets, it's players for players. Yeah. And I think the Flames will do another minor deal where they will bring in a draft pick. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked by that either. I I can see them flipping something like John Gillies for a third or something like that. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked by that. I, I actually wouldn't be shocked um, if the Flames made three or four trades in total, even though like some of them w- obviously wouldn't be like major deals or anything like that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know... I don't know how much movement there is. It seems like if you look at the rumor mill, there's a lot of top guys being rumored. And I think it's going to be a trade deadline day where there's not a lot of teams that want to make moves until those top guys are cleared. True. And I'm not sure they'll all be off the board yet. And even making moves like for a goalie, I think a lot of teams are going to say, well, let's wait and see what happens to Bobrovsky and Varlamov and stuff. So I don't know. It's worth making the small deals. And if you look at tree, he often makes those small deals midway into July. Yeah, true enough. So could be, but I just think, I think you'll see probably one deal of player for pick. I think you'll see a bigger deal, which is players for players. Yeah. Like I'm expecting TJ Brody for a top six forward deal to be made. Uh, Yeah. I think it'll be Brody and something. I think it'll be either like Brody and one of our bottom six guys, like a Brody and Bennett or Brody and Gillies. I don't think you do one for one. It just, again, depends on who and what. But yeah, but, but if you look at the assets that are really worth the most in the NHL when it comes to trades, it's top top defenseman. Which no matter what you think of TJ Brody, he was the number two defenseman on the best team in the West. Like there's value yeah. in that, and young goalies, which we have a couple of that we could look at yep. moving. So I think that there's assets there for the Flames. I wouldn't honestly be surprised, Matt, if there's something already done, and the league's just saying we'll announce it at the draft. Yeah. Or closer to like the know, draft or something like that. No. Well, I think they, I think for the TV excitement of it, they like to keep some of those things for the draft. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's playoffs. I, I no tree. He's probably been working. Um, I bet something's done. I don't even know if the fax machine's turned on the league since the trade deadline's yeah. over. We'll have to but. see about that. Should we fax the league and see if they get back yeah. to us? Do you still have a fax machine so we can send them well, one? Well, there's a post office somewhere that you can use. <laughs> should we Should we put our trade on a pigeon and send it towards the headquarters? Go this way. <laughs> That's right. Find the small man <laughs> with the bad haircut. Give him this deal. 
<laughs> and then boo him on your way out. Go, pigeon. I'm not saying coo. I'm saying boo. <laughs> That's right. Boo! 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 As he flies by oh. Batman. Boo! Boo! He's like, wow, the pigeon's an NHL fan. <laughs> oh, no. And anyway, good for Boston fans they, yesterday to keep up the tradition. Boo! <laughs> boo! All right, well, let's talk about the draft. So uh, we'll go through this. We'll do we'll do a deep analysis of the first round because that's the easiest one to get, I think, people interested in. And then we'll talk more in general about what picks the Flames do and don't have and what type of players they might be going for. Yeah. So round one, number 26 overall, um, you've identified five guys here you think they might take. I think three of these are probably about right, but let's jump through this one at a time. The first one you'd mentioned was uh, the guy who has been rated number 24 by NHL Central Scouting for North American skaters. Uh, Connor McMichael played for the London Knights of the OHL. He's 5'11", 18 years old, 174 pounds, plays center uh, from... Uh, Ajax, Ontario, and this past season in the OHL, he played 67 games, 36 goals, 36 assists for 72 total points with uh, the Knights during the regular season. So, Matt, what do you like about uh, about Connor McMichael? Uh, he's got a decent shot, uh, both a quick wrister and a decent slap shot. Uh, he's more quick than not. And he's just a solid all-around offensive player. And it's hard to find guys like that that at number 26. And he has the makings of a top six forward. And his offensive instincts are notable. Like, he, the guy he reminds me the most of uh, without the Canadian team heroics is Jordan Eberle. And just the right nose for the net and just a all around decently skilled player. And I don't think that he's going to be the most defensively sound guy, nor do I think that he'll stick as a center. I think he'll be moved over to the wing at the, the pro level, but he just looks like a solid skater out there. And, higher level of skill than you typically find for anybody rated in the 20s from what i've seen of him and being ohl i haven't seen him in person but i've seen some footage of this guy he seems to have a better read of the game than a lot of guys at that level yeah i think it's why he's effective as center he's a left-handed shot like you said i can see them playing him on the wing i can also see him being sort of like lazar where he could play all over the ice but i think just from what i've seen from this guy He's got a good scoring touch in the juniors. Um, you know, he's got as many goals as he did assists. I think you'll see him turn in the NHL into more of a playmaker and less of the really uh, big scoring threat. I think this is the guy that sets up the plays, makes the pass, and has to have a setup man to really be at his best. Yeah, I can see that. He's just an all around. He he's a serviceable offensive forward. Like, he's not going to yeah. be a game breaker by himself, but. You can stick them with players that know what they're doing and they'll be successful. And that, yep. you know, for 26 overall, that's awesome. The concern some people have mentioned from him is the size. Yeah, but you're looking uh, like with most of the guys that are in that range. Like there's a few guys that are bigger, but they kind of suck, frankly, on the overall. Like they're slow and it. <laughs> It's just, you're giving up size, of course, to get the skill. Like, if he was, say, 6'3", I think he's in the top 10. It's... I agree. Just that, you know... And and Bob McKenzie has him ranked at 26 overall, so that would fall pretty much right to where yeah. the Flames are. Yeah. So, yeah, I think de definitely a guy that I could see the Flames going after. And I, I'd find it funny uh, if the Flames drafted him because they'd have Connor McDavid and we'd have Connor McMichael. You you need to get David McConnor. Yes. <laughs> um, centerman, again, left shot, I think. And it's hard to kind of predict three, four years out, but... 
I don't think this is a guy who jumps right to the NHL by no. any means, but I think that left wing for this team is going to be pretty clogged up for the next couple of years. I could see. I think they might have to keep him center just to get him a spot outside of the bottom six. Yeah, and I think that you're more likely to see him basically follow the same trajectory as Dylan Dubé, where it's like two, three years of you know from draft to graduating into the NHL, and slowly as he comes, like I wouldn't even expect him to be more than a fourth line forward in his first year. Just ease him in there and then let him take more as he can do so. Yeah, then there's a guy who plays all of his junior eligibility. Yeah, same here. Um, you know, then probably jumps to the A for a year. I think this is a guy who you can develop slowly and still get the best out yeah. of. So the next guy you had on the list, um, this is a player that I really like on this list from WHL Prince Albert is Brett Leeson. He's a right winger. 20 years old, so a little bit uh, older than a few guys on this list. Six foot four, 201 pounds, shoots right. Uh, he's from Calgary, so another Calgary boy here. And he played for Prince Albert in the WHL 55 games. He had 36 goals, uh, 53 assists for 89 total points, and also played for Team Canada World Junior. Uh, five games, got five total points. So this is a guy I've seen a few times, being that he's in Prince Albert, but what do you like about uh, Leeson? He, the guy he reminds me most of is Tanner Pearson. Uh, Pearson, a few years ago, was drafted by the Kings with the last pick of the first round, and he pretty much stepped into the NHL right away. Leeson was not very good in his draft year or his draft plus one year, but he seems to have figured everything out this year. And he looks like a reasonably good third line forward with second line upside and he's a guy that like i i think he'd play maybe half a season to a full season in the ahl and then would be ready to step in so like if the flames wanted a pick where the guy is going to be there right away leeson would be a decent option uh i don't think he has the upper level upside of a couple of the guys on this list but he is pretty much at developed level and like you can pretty much just plug and play his skating really improved this year and that's i think why he jumps so high on a lot of people's radars mm -hmm. um looking good there i agree with you he doesn't have that high-end impact but as we've talked about a lot on the show not every first rounder needs to be your top line guy i mean we even see you know michael backland now who you know, is more of the defensive forward. And, uh, you know, Sam Bennett, who's played on the third line, first round picks. So I think this guy, honestly, could be a role player. And I can see because of his size, they could try to use him more in the agitator role like we saw Bennett grow into or into this year. Yeah, and that one... You know, not not the not the face puncher like the you know McGratton, but the guy like Bennett who can move the puck, who has the offensive upside, but someone who can be that sandpaper bottom yeah, six. Yeah, just an all around decent guy, and I, I wouldn't be shocked if the Flames went that route, uh, that he would play sooner than later in the NHL. Well, and I think that's the interesting thing, too. He is 20. I don't know I would turn him pro right away. I think... Well, he'd um, have to go to I the think A. this is a guy yeah. you... He'd have to go to the A, I think. Yeah. But... But even then, I'm not sure... I'm not sure they need him there right away with all the European guys. Yeah. I think this is a guy you bring to rookie camp, give him a look, um, and see what you want to do after that. But I'd be totally fine with him going back to juniors for one year. I think... Brett's a guy who could benefit from sort of being the big fish in a small pond. Yeah. Um, but I can, I can see Brett. Um, I'm trying to think how to say this. I can see him going about 23, 24. I can also see just because of his age, him dropping a little yeah. bit. I wouldn't be shocked if uh, the Ducks ended up picking him at 29. That that would be where I'd kind of see him fitting in, but. And this is a guy who, like you said earlier, if the Flames make a trade to move down, that's when I think Leeson becomes much more of a viable option if they move from like twenty sixth to twenty ninth or thirtieth. Yeah, I agree. I don't see him going out of the outside of the first round, but I can see if if they like Leeson, that's where you might say, yeah, okay, we'll move down a little yeah. bit. I agree. So. 
not my first pick here, but I think a, a viable pick from the Calgary yeah, Flames. He's he's probably third or fourth on my list, but it, it's one of those where if, frankly, if any of these five get drafted by the Flames, I'm not going to be overly upset by any of them, really, because they're all yeah. decent players. And I think with Leeson, too, being a right winger, um, that ability to step in right away is going to be a little bit higher than some of the guys playing left or center because right wing is still a need for this team. And even if you look at the, at the Stockton team, there's not a lot of right wingers there either. Uh, The next guy on the list is Jacob Peltier. He played for the Moncton Wildcats of the QMJHL. He's 18, five foot nine, 161 pounds, potentially the next Johnny Goudreau there uh, from Quebec city. And with the Moncton Wildcats this year, 68 games or 65 games, 39 goals, 50 assists for 89 total points, three points in the playoffs. And he played seven games for Team Canada U18 and got uh, two assists. So this is a guy I also really like on the list. But what do you like about Peltier? Uh, he reminds me a lot of Anthony Beauvillier. Um, he's not quite as fast as Beauvillier, but it's close. And he's just a very good talented offensive player in pretty much every way um dynamic stick handler excellent passer good shot good deking ability good enough speed where he's about as fast as Gaudreau so more than able to be a decent player I think he has the most high level of skill of the five players I don't know if he's there yet, but I think he has one of the highest upsides of these. Yeah, guys. I agree. Him, um, I could see he's... like if everything cracked the right way for him, I could see him being a first line near All Star caliber player. I think he has the upside to be Johnny Goudreau. Yeah. I don't know if he gets there, but I think he's of these guys. I think he's probably the one with the highest upside. I agree. Um. Rated num uh, rated by McKenzie is 31, so a little bit lower. And I can see just because of his size, I can also see him going a little bit lower. Um, he is number 27 among NHL skaters. So we already looked at number 24 with McMichael, 25 with Leeson, and now 27 with Peltier. Um, the only thing I can think of is with the Flames already having a couple undersized guys with Mangiapane, with... Um, you know, Goudreau, I can maybe see them wanting to stay away from another small guy. Yeah, and that is understandable, but, you know, it just depends. That, like, if they're just wanting high-end skill, period, then I you can't really go wrong with Peltier. Peltier is a guy who I think if you look at him, he's not going to be your number one scorer. He's not your Johnny Goudreau. This is a guy who is a playmaker, and even if we look at his numbers in the QMJHL every year, more assists than goals. This is your your setup man for your top center down the road. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, we've looked at a few of these guys. I think more so than McMichael. He's a playmaker. He's creative. Um, he likes to carry the puck. But I think that, you know, if we're looking for the next, you know, top goal scorer, I don't think this guy's it. But I think he could be part of that, you know, top line in the future. Yep. And this guy's almost the setup man you need for a guy like Johnny, even though he's a left winger. Yeah, or you could even throw him on the second line with Kachuk. Like, there's plenty of options available. So, yeah, he just needs to be playing with high, higher quality players, and the Flames are very deep, so th- there's options available. He, uh, the next guy on the list that you'd point out, this is actually a guy I'm really fond of, uh, Jameson Reese of the Starnia Sting in the OHL. He's 18. Five foot ten, hundred and seventy-two pounds from Hamilton. Uh, he's listed as a centerman, and he is the number thirty North American skater, ranked number forty-three by TSN and Bob McKenzie. In uh, this past season, he played thirty-seven games for Sarnia, had ten goals, twenty-two assists for thirty-two total points, and with Canada U eighteen, he played seven games, got two goals, six assists for eight total points. Even though I think Peltier has the higher upside, I'm really a fan of Reese. Yeah, he is very fast. And with speed being such a factor, especially in our playoff series against Colorado, I would not be shocked if he's on the board if that's where the Flames went. But 
I don't think his skill level is as good as any of the the other three guys, but it's close enough where the speed game, I think, makes the difference. Where I think you see Reese become a viable pick is if, as you mentioned, the Flames move their first and get end up getting a high second instead. I can see them then targeting. Yeah, like if the Flames say traded down uh, to like say thirty six and thirty seven with Carolina or something like that. Uh, where you know you're getting two upper level second round picks or I something like that. I would be surprised if they use the 26 pick on Reese. Um, I, yeah. I think that's too high to use here. They currently don't have a second rounder, but I can see if they fall into the second round or if they can grab a second rounder through another trade. I think this might be the guy. This was sort of the guy I was looking at for the Flames to take second. Yeah. So I like him, but I just I think he's. I think there's too many flaws with this player to take him 26 with some of these other guys still on the board. Yeah, I agree. Um, and it'd be like it would be like that's okay if they went that route, but it, you know, I if the other guys were on the board, I'd might be going, huh, you know, may might have been better to go a different route. Yeah, I mean, it it, it just makes, depends. It makes like, you I, wonder I at would that point expect... what the Flames see in him that we don't see. Yeah. And I think after two years of not having a first, they really can't make a gamble with their first if they keep it. Yeah. So, so we'll see what happens. But I, I just I don't see Reese with the twenty six pick if they move down to thirty thirty one or like you said even into the top ten of the second. I could see this guy being the guy they pick up. I don't see them trading for a second to get this guy, but I think he's probably the guy that's on the board if they move to the second. Like, I don't think you go out and get a pick just to get Reese. Yeah, he's not that otherworldly where, oh, we must have this guy. But if he's there and there's nobody that's clearly better, then why not? And then the last guy that you wanted to mention here, number 11 by the NHL Central Scouting Bureau in terms of European skaters, 29th overall by Bob McKenzie is Niels Hoaglander. He's 18, left winger, 5'9", 187 pounds, plays for, uh, he played for Rogel. I hope I'm saying that right. They're the European team that has a yeah. green version of the Oilers logo, so I don't like them because of that already. Um and he, that's in Sweden. And this past season in Sweden, he played 50 games, 14 points. Remember, this is a men's league, so it is different than Canadian juniors. Uh, and had uh, 14 total points, 7 goals, 7 assists. With Swedish Sweden's U20 team, he played 8 games, 4 goals, 3 assists for 7 total points. This isn't a guy I'm a huge fan of. What made you put Hoaglander on the board? Uh, you can erase his name and write Yuri Hoodler in there, and you wouldn't notice the difference. It, it, it's the same player. Like, similar height, same speed, dynamic playing-making ability, good shot. Not anything that particularly wows you, but he's just good in every facet of his game. And th- he's just solid all the way around, and... Guys like that tend to, when they're drafted, they tend to actually develop when they don't really have any observable flaws. Like, he's a little short, but not overly so. And he's stocky. He's 188 pounds, even though he's 5'9". So, it, it's... I it, When I watch him play, it, I, you know, being a fan of the Flames, you see Yuri Hoodler, and, you know, it, it's the same guy. It, there's it's as close of a comparison as I've seen between two different players. That's how virtually identical they are. Huh. Okay, I hadn't thought of them that way. I haven't seen a ton of them, but I hadn't thought of them that way. Um, yeah, it, it's one of those where like he's not like overly fast or overly a good shot or an overly good playmaker he just does everything it's sort of like monahan where like everything's not a five it's like a four four and a half and it's the same thing with hoaglander where like everything's just a tier below being elite 
and he just is very solid all the way around. And I think he... A lot of fans will look at his numbers and say they're not very good, but again, we have to remember the difference between the Swedish Elite League and, say, the OHL or the WHL. Yeah, well, one of the guys that I actually like for one of our later round draft picks had a grand total of zero goals and zero assists this season, so... <laughs> is he a goaltender? No, he's a forward. <laughs> So, wow. yeah, but that does happen. And like uh, one of the players that was of similar to the other guy I'm mentioning uh, was Matthias Janmark. And in his draft year had zero goals, zero assists. And yet he's emerged into being a high quality forward for Dallas. So, it, you know, the stats are not everything. And it's nope. just a general-ish guideline. And like especially like when you're talking first yeah no i'm not saying there but i think there's a number of fans that look at those numbers yeah. well like especially with the, the guys that are rated close to or in the first round like you pretty much have to figure that they know how to play the basics of the game otherwise they wouldn't be there mm -hmm. and so for you're sure. just looking for all the little subtleties in their game and uh that's where you know it it makes you know scouting a lot more difficult because you know all of the players are fairly talented it's just if you're going based on stats alone you can make a lot of mistakes very quickly matt i'm gonna add a couple guys to the list here a couple guys that i like that weren't on your list curious what you think these guys are probably going to be gone by the time the flames get there and i wouldn't necessarily trade up to get them but one guy that i really like from the barry colts is ryan suzuki uh he's number uh, 18 in North American skaters, number 12 overall by McKenzie. Um, I he's a really smart player, great skater, excellent passer. Um, six foot, 181 pounds. He's a centerman, and with uh, Barry this year, he played in 65 games, 25 goals, 50 assists, and 75 total points. I've seen a lot of footage on this guy, and he seems like the kind of sort of dynamic playmaker that we need. Yeah, and I would be shocked if he hit 20 even. And that's the unfortunate part. He's a really good player, and I like him a lot. It's just I don't see any realistic way that he'd fall down that far. Well, and it's interesting because a lot of these players, when you look at all the different sort of people ranking them, are very similar. He's one of these guys, and we see one or two of them every year that are all over the board. Hockeyprospect.com has him 26. Future Considerations 14. ISS is 21. Uh, McKean's is 22. 18th in North American Skaters by the NHL. 23 by Elite Prospects. Like, it seems like there's something there that every team is seen a little bit differently, or every scout is seen a little bit differently. Yeah. And he he looks to be a decent player. I, I just, I don't really, you know, like, especially with the teams that are picking a, around where, like, 18 to 23, like, I don't see any of the teams passing him by. Like, Dallas is pretty good. Uh, the Rangers, they're looking for higher-end talent. Pittsburgh's looking for higher-end talent. The only reason I think he might be on the board, there's a couple defensemen I have rated in that area, like Ryan uh, Johnson, uh, Honka, and Kokanen I have rated in that area. And I could see Calgary's – oh, and Thomas Harley as well. I, can, I don't think Calgary wants to take a defenseman, but I think Suzuki could be on the board if a few teams decide to take a defenseman. Yeah, and if there is one defenseman available at 26 that I'd really like, and that that would be Matthew Robertson uh, from the Oil Kings, but I, I don't see him making it that far down either. No, I, I don't think he falls that far. And that's the problem. Like, there's a um, bunch of really dynamic decent players it's just that unfortunately like especially with the type of teams that are there i don't see like pittsburgh la nashville the islanders ottawa or the rangers passing up any of the higher end flashy guys like i don't see them taking like the mackelrath type guy who's like just big and you know there yeah you know it that's where it's gonna be tough like i you know it honestly with any of the higher end guys if they fall to 26 you just jump on that you know yeah without question it's just and usually usually there's one guy if you look in the 20s every year 
usually there's one guy that you're surprised is still around. Usually they don't fall, say, out of, you know, the top uh, five to number 20, but usually there's a couple guys in that 20 to 30 range that fall. And one guy I could see being is uh, Trevor Zigris. Yeah. Um, he's Boston College, uh, played for, I believe, the U.S. National Development Team last year. This is a guy I actually really like his game. I think he's quite a dynamic player. Six feet, 174 pounds, 18 years old. He can play center and wing uh, from Bedford, New York. I don't think he falls to us, but this is a guy I think he'll probably go about 20 to 23. This is a guy I might even be willing to trade up to get. Yeah, it, I don't see him falling that far. Like I don't even, I no. don't even think he gets fifteen. So, like, where is he ranked? Let's see. Uh, he is, I think he's in the top ten of North American skaters. I'm just waiting for the list to load here. Yeah. Uh, he is number uh, number ten by ISS, number six in North American skaters. Yeah, everyone, everyone thinks he'll go high. It's. I don't think he falls down, but he's one of my favorite players outside the top ten in this draft. Yeah, I agree. I, I, gonna, I like him. We're not going to trade into a top. Yeah. We're not going to trade into a top ten position this year, but if he's available at you know nineteen twenty, I could see moving up to get yeah. him. Yeah, and I think a lot of teams that are in that ballpark might do be calling up. I agree. Other teams and offering the same kind of situation because this this is a year i can actually see there being quite a lot of pick movement like we often see it in the fourth you move a fourth and a seventh for someone's fourth this year this is a year i can see there being quite a bit of movement in the top 60 yeah well especially with certain teams not performing well like say pittsburgh having like the 21st overall pick like i can see them trying to jump down to like uh 15 or so possibly or something like that if they really like somebody um it just depends and like there seems to be about 15 guys that are above everybody else and i don't really see them falling to 26 there might be no. one and like if say like suzuki falls to 26 then yeah you do it but i just i don't see any realistic no. way especially with the teams that are behind us in the draft like the Islanders, Nashville, Washington, like they they have similar drafting priorities that we do, and mm -hmm. so like I don't if we're all looking at the same board in the same way, I just don't see how one of the higher end guys falls to us. If you look at the list, it's interesting this year. Not as many U.S. college players as we've had in the past. A lot more uh, WHL, OHL. This is a really good year for the OHL, but a lot of Canadian prospects in the top, I'd say, 50 this year. Yep. Um, not Flames related, but any doubt in your mind that Hughes goes first? I'm still on a little on the coin toss there, but I would be somewhat shocked if he doesn't. Between him and Keiko? Yeah. Yeah, I think those are one, two. I think Hughes goes first. I can see some movement in the top top ten. Um, I really like Turcotte, and I could see him going higher. Um, not in the top two, but I can see him going higher than some people have him. Same with Krebs, but that's another story for another day. Yeah. Um, couple guys you had on your list here are sort of outside, outside chance guys. Probably, I would imagine, not guys you'd take with your first pick, but if we could get a pick in the second round, is that kind of where you're looking uh, at these even guys? Even our third or fourth yeah, you know, it's okay. like, uh, yeah, I don't see. Yeah, they might go before we pick at eighty eight, but yeah, they're close enough where it's in that ballpark. Because after the second round, it's kind of a, everybody kind of does their own thing and picks their own list, and yeah, it just depends really. Well, let's look at these guys. The first one you had for us is a Swede, uh, Elben Gru. Is that yeah. how you say his last name? And he's a six-footer, 187 pounds, 18 years old, can play center and right wing. Uh, he's from Sweden. He played for, and I can never pronounce the team name, Jug Gardens. Yeah. You guys can look it up. Tell me if I'm wrong. Tweet us. Um, and in the previous season, he played for... Uh, Jude Gardens played a whole bunch of games, but mostly for their their junior team. 
uh, 25 games there, 13 goals, uh, 21 assists for 34 total points. He also played for the big team and the the under-18 team. So it's a bit different in Sweden. Yeah. But, uh, uh, for, what, do you, what do you like about this This kid? was the guy who had zero goals and zero assists that I was mentioning earlier. Oh, okay. Uh, well, it depends what league you look yeah, at, man. I true. mean, he had, zero, he had zero goals on a team that he played like two, ga- two games for, but he played the majority of the season at the U-20 league. Yeah. 25 game 25 games 13 goals 21 assists for 34 points yeah uh and 102 penalty minutes this guy could rival tim hunter and that's exactly why i like him uh it's the penalty minutes uh he is a he reminds me a lot of what sam bennett is right now uh he's fast uh he's a very intense player physical uh, decent offensive abilities and just a lot of energy and he's a de- decent defensive forward and he's yet he can contribute offensively and it's one of those situations where like I don't see him ever turning into a top six forward but he might be one of those really annoying third line fourth line guys uh, some of the some of the draft snippets that I have for him Plays with considerable energy, is a threat down the right side when he puts his shoulder down to attack wide and then drive the net. He's at the top of the food chain, a T-Rex, eats everything and thinks everything is under him. And thirdly, slick stick handler, dangerous in the offensive end, plays a fast game, works hard every shift, deadly on the power play. From what I've seen, and I'll admit very little with this guy, I agree with you. He's sort of your third, your third, fourth line agitator. I think he's a guy that could have a long NHL career, but he has a depth NHL career. Yeah, and he did play 15 games this year in the pro league with zero zeros across the board. Oh, did yeah. he? But um, okay, yeah, no, uh, he. Oh, you're right. He did. Um, he's just very solid all the way around, and you know you need higher end depth guys like it sort of like uh darren helmet or justin abdelkader from detroit where they're just they can contribute a little bit offensively but they're primarily a high quality defensive player and he brings some physicality as well he's a right winger so it's one of those where he kind of fits like all the check marks of what you would want for like a third round pick yeah, I, I would not, if we managed to get a second, I don't think I'd use a second on this guy. Then there's more talented players that'll come available there. Yeah. But if he falls to 88, or even if we trade up a little bit in the third, I think this is a perfect third round pick. Yeah. Not, not going to um, blow you away, rated, but he's enough there where you're, he draws your attention. Yeah. He's number one in the North American uh, skaters, or sorry, he's uh, number 13 in the EU skaters list, number 44 by TSN McKenzie. But sort of like you said, guys like this often get overlooked in the second. Everyone's got their own list, and I can see him falling a little bit. Yeah. But the same time, if we don't get him, no big yeah, deal. Yeah, exactly. Like, the, this is just one of the few guys that was like rated a little lower that sparked some interest. Yeah, because it like especially after the second round, like it's not like we have a ton of video on any of the players, so it's kind of hard to, like we can read what the scouting report is, but you know, so can you as listeners. So, yeah. You know, and if we have anyone that's seen these guys, if they're from your local town, you've seen them play, let us know what you think. Because yeah, like Matt said, there's what seven rounds and thirty two teams now. There's a lot of players that it's hard to see them. Yeah, all. and like once you get past about fifty, like finding any content on the players is virtually impossible and the next guy you had is one of your long shots um from the saint john sea dogs i believe it's pronounced maxim kashvik um and he's 5'11 187 pounds 18 years old from slovakia a little bit of a different hockey nation there uh and he played in the qmjhl like we said for the sea dogs 60 games 22 goals, uh, 24 assists for 46 total points. He also played for Slovakia's under-18 team where he play, He was pretty much point per game there. Um, what I've heard him compared, not so much compared to, but the scouting report is he moves quickly on the ice. He competes hard and doesn't need much room to release his shot. I've heard him compared, I think, 
a lot of people are looking at him a little higher than he probably should be in comparisons. But what do you think of this guy? Uh, he's another one of those guys who does everything generally okay. Um, he reminds me a little bit of uh, Ruzitska from the past season. Um, just uh, some offensive ability. He's only 5'11", um, but he's like the, it's another one of those players where all of the parts are decent. Like there's no higher level thing, but like across the board, everything is like a three and a half, four where out of five and where like just checking all the marks where like his passing ability is good. His shot is good. He's not great at anything, but he has enough talent across the board to probably make it. Yeah, and if he, you know, like when prospects, if they develop any of their pro abilities beyond what they are, you know, if you got a guy who's basically decent or above average in everything, and then one of those skills shoots up more, then you've got a really dynamite player, and you know it, whether that will happen with him i'm not sure but you know it, he'd be rated a lot higher if he didn't have a few warts on him see like i said i think when i said that people have been comparing him sort of highly i've heard him called the poor man zach sanford i don't think he'll ever be that good yeah um i think i think this is a guy who would probably be i mean if you want to compare him to I don't even know what NHL right now they compare him to. I haven't seen enough, but I think this is a guy who is a bottom six guy. Uh, if he if he basically stays where he is, then he'll be your NHL, AHL tweener type. But if any of his skills jumps a bit, then he could become an impact player. No, I think you know, he, his six. speed is what's going to give him more chances than he should get. Yeah, he, if he develops properly, he could be a serviceable middle six forward. But uh, again, certain things would have to happen. Yeah. So uh, of this list that we've gone through, let's take uh, Gru. Uh, let's take the last two guys out. But of that list that you and I talked about, which was. Um, McMichael, Leeson, Peltier, Reese, Hoagland, uh, Suzuki, and uh, Zigris. What does your gut say? Who do the Flames end up with? I would be happy with, uh, frankly, any of those players. Um, tops on my list would be either Hoaglander or Peltier. I'm assuming that the two higher ranked guys are gone by the, when we pick. Um, after that so you think you think mcmichael and uh who's the other higher rank guy mcmichael michael and leeson are gone uh no i i was meaning the two guys that you mentioned suzuki oh. and the other guy Z zigris and suzuki yeah. yeah i'm assuming they're gone but um of those guys those would be my two peltier and hoaglander uh but if the flames ended up with mcmichael Rees, or leeson i wouldn't be complaining at all yeah, it's a tough one for me. I guess it's partly tough for me because I'm almost, and I have to not do this. You're looking at this first round pick as making up for lost time. It's like we got to get somebody good to make it for the ones we've lost. But I think Peltier would be my pick here. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't, like I said, I like yeah, I like Rees, but I wouldn't use the 26 on Rees. Yeah, I agree. There are a few players that I'd be quite disappointed if the Flames did go that route, but yeah. I would be naming like 15 guys, so don't want to. Do you think, looking at the guys on the board, do you think the Flames surprise us and take a defenseman? Uh, if the right guy is available, then sure, but, you know. Who do you think that would be? Do you see anyone that you think would fall that far that would make it? Uh, like, I don't think you'd take Johnson or Honka or Kokonen. Yeah, uh, Robertson, if he's available. After that, it, I'd have to see more of them each of them went like after we select them really um because like valimaki i didn't really see a ton of prior to us selecting them and yet like as soon as i was able to get access to more video i really liked the pick and have since really liked the pick 
So it, the only reason I think we don't go with a defenseman is we've got such a log jam already on the blue line that I think that they need to stay away from that position. Yeah, like if the Flames are like they need more defensemen in the system, but you can use your third, your fourth, your fifth, and so on. Yeah, you know, and get some serviceable depth guys that way. I uh, I I think there's enough higher end forwards where you're going to it would be in terms of just raw asset you're gonna get more from the forward than you would the defensemen that are in that range i agree yeah and and again looking at where these guys will even be when they get to sort of you know when they get to the nhl i think we're gonna have a log jam on the blue line for a couple of years yeah and you and you don't want Adam Fox like scenario where it's well I'm not going to make it I don't want to be here yeah and that's the problem like if you look at most of the guys that are around that rank like their upside is more like four five six than one two three and yeah. you know like there's a couple of guys that might be more on the top end of that but yeah uh, you know it where some of the forwards they look like if they click you might actually get an impact forward out of the deal. So, you know, and as you said, when the Flames have four defensemen that are under the age of 22 and all in the NHL right now between Shillington, Hannafin, Anderson, and Valimaki, it's like, uh, well, where do you put the rest of everybody? You know, like, like, Giordano is going to be here for another year or two at a minimum, and Hamanek's likely going to get retained and so, okay, what do you do with the rest of the spots? Well, they're already taken. So it it's just one of those situations where Calgary just happened to luck out into falling into a whole pile of defensive depth where they can, for a year or two, take more depth guys. And then I would go back to first-round defensemen, like, say, in 2021 or something like that. Looking at the uh, sort of the different trusted rating services, if you will, um, the uh, hockeyprospects.com final 31 has Ryan Suzuki fallen to 26, which I think, like I said, I'd be really happy if he did. Yeah, I just um, don't, don't see that... any realistic way that that happens. No, me neither. They've got some weird choices in yeah. here. Um, but yeah. And then if we look at the, which one is this, this is the future considerations.com at 26. They actually have guys that weren't even on our list, like Pavel Dorofeev. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, and I think that's high for him. Yeah, I think that, that's a late second. Yeah. And that player is not very good. No. And then if we look at McKean's McKean's, I found has generally been pretty, pretty close the last couple of years in the bottom 10 of the first. And they've got Albert Johansson, who's a defenseman, so I don't think that they take him. But they've got here, like I thought, there's a bunch of teams that they think might be going uh, with a defenseman, so there might be a few forwards that open up. Yeah. But, yeah, I think I think this is a very forward-heavy first round. Yeah, I agree. And you know that there's always going to be teams that are just going to say, we need a defenseman, so we're going to take the guy, even though... And there are some very high-end defensemen, if you want. Yeah, one. it's just... Yeah, the the more defensemen and Spencer Knight that get taken before the Flames pick, the better forward we'll get. So that's well, that's it. I almost I'm I'm hoping more teams in front of us take defensemen because it means the good forwards will drop. Yeah, and there's enough good. I can. Yeah, there's enough good forwards available where I think that we'd get one regardless. But yeah. And like I said, I think there will be enough movement on the floor. I wouldn't be surprised. Not Calgary, but I wouldn't be surprised if you see a team who wants a defenseman who tries to trade back in for a second crack to get a forward as well. That's possible. So it won't be Calgary, but I can see somebody doing it. Yeah. And, you know, like Calgary, uh, because of their prospect pool, like they're pretty much empty everywhere except for goaltending. So, you know, if the best player available as a forward then that's where the flames will likely go and if it's a defenseman that's where they'll go and we need everything really so i i think i would be surprised if they take a defenseman even with the best player available i think this you're gonna see a forward in the first round i wouldn't be shocked either well let's take a look down the draft here i'll go through sort of what picks we have and don't have ready matt there's a little confusing 
No second round pick. We traded what should have been the 57th pick to the Islanders in the Hamannick deal. So we don't currently pick at time of recording in the second. As I said earlier, I don't think that will be true on the draft floor. But as of right now, we have no second. Yeah, we have. I, I think the Flames see enough talent. They would try to trade into the second. I think it'll be too expensive to trade into the first. But I think you can trade into the second in this draft. Yeah, or trading the first downwards, possibly, depending. Yeah, but I, I don't think you can – I don't think the Flames would want to give up what it would cost to get another pick in the top 31. No. Um, we have our own pick in the third round, which should be pick 88. The fourth round's weird. We traded our pick to Montreal, but we have New York Islanders pick, which is the 116th pick. That was part of the Hammock deal. We have our our own fifth round pick, 150th overall. We don't have a sixth round pick. We traded to Carolina in the Eddie Lack deal. That's a trade I didn't want to see pop its head up again. Um, and then in the seventh round, we don't have our pick. We traded to Ottawa for Nick Shore, but we do have Carolina's pick from the Eddie Lack deal, number two, 216. So essentially to break that down, we will pick in round one. Round three, round four, round five, and round seven. So quite a good smattering of picks for the Flames. We're not going to go through players at all these rounds, but I think we can talk about sort of in general what the Flames need. And Matt, every year you say the Flames should be taking a goaltender. Um, last, The last goalie we really saw taken was Mason McDonald. Well, Parsons. We, we, saw, we saw Parsons, um, but I guess the last shocker was how, how high they took McDonald. Yeah. Um, where would what pick would you spend that we currently have on a goalie? I'm gonna break with tradition and say that we don't need to. No. Yeah. This time, no. I don't think we have a high end goalie, but I think we have enough goalie talent. Period. That we need to wait and see what happens. Yeah, I agree. And frankly, the goalies this year, outside of Spencer Knight, kind of are just mediocre. Like I'm, I haven't been wowed by any of them. So it's like there, there's bound to be one or two good ones in the draft. It's just that, yeah, uh, I wouldn't really like. There's no real onus on us using a pick. If you want one, I use the seventh rounder. Yeah, grab whoever's last. Yeah. But I think if you look at, I mean, we got Nick Shore, we got, or not Nick Shore, we got Nick Schneider, we've got Mason McDonald, we've got Parsons, we've got Gillies, we've got Riddick. Like uh, we got, got that new Russian goalie there. that we signed as well. So exactly, I I think you've almost got to see what you've got and what you don't before you take another goalie. Yeah. And if you're looking for, I hate to say it, if you're looking for not very good goaltenders for your system, you and I see see them every year at rookie camp. They seem to find adequate goaltenders out of college like i think if you're just looking for a guy who's there you can pick that up as a free yeah, agent you have pads you're good <laughs> well i mean you know we didn't think a lot of schneider till he came in true but you know if you're looking for that i guess i shouldn't say guys there if you're looking for that sort of ahl backup echl starter um you know you can probably find that guy scouting your colleges yeah oh i agree so unless they think they've got a high-end goaltender, which I would not want to come into the Flames organization now being a goalie and try to fight my way up that depth chart. No, and like you just look at Bennington, like he it took him until he was 25 to emerge and you know, we have a couple of goalies in Gillies and McDonald that are kind of getting closer to that age where they might turn yeah. it on. So, you know, like McDonald looked a lot better this past season. He might end up becoming something. You never know. I, and I think there's a few guys the Flames have to make decisions on this year. I think this year will be the Gillies decision and the McDonald decision. Yeah. And I think then you can bring a guy in next year once you've either decided to keep them or move them. But yeah, I don't think you need a goalie this year. Yeah, and I think we have the full stock of picks for next season. So I don't see like I, I would be more willing to you know use like the second round pick on a goalie next year. Because we'd, we'd have one. and We have all our picks for once? Wow. I think so. I don't recall. Let me go check. Yeah, I think so. Uh, tw no, 2020, we're missing our fourth. Oh, yes. Okay. 2021, we have everything. The fourth rounder was... Uh, when was that? What trade was that part of? Let me see. That was the Oscar Fenton Oh, yeah, pick. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, no big deal then. 
but so, still, it's a fourth. If you use your second on a goalie, it's like, okay, yeah, that's fine. So I'm not overly concerned. Like, I'd rather use a higher level pick than a lower level pick if you're getting a goalie. Um, and honestly, I think, like, last season's draft for the Flames was fairly awesome, considering the Flames didn't have a top 60 pick. Um, they picked a lot of high-end skill guys that had holes in their game and are all, most of them are playing significantly better than what what they were drafted as and yeah i think this is a year though that if you trade out of trade all your chips out of the top 60 you're gonna regret it down the road oh i agree i think you could afford to do it last year maybe even the year before when we did pretty well in the second round but i think if we trade out of the top was it 62 now with uh, vegas I think we're going to regret it. Yeah. The only realistic way that trading number 26 and not getting a draft pick back is if you're getting like a impact impact forward that you can sign for like six, seven, eight years. Well, and that I think becomes the issue is you would need to get a guy who's almost 25, 26. And I don't know that you're going to get that for the reasonable cost. We think. Yeah, I know. Wishless Taylor Hall, but yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Taylor Hall, you would need the first. You'd need Brody, and you need at least one other asset. Yeah, I agree. You know, and I don't think the Flames want to blow everything in one deal. No. Um, so we won't, like I said, we won't go through each of these. Overall, though, I think you said earlier, and I think you were pretty close to being probably where the team is, which is we just need to restock the entire set of cupboards. If you look at the Stockton Heat, they were pretty sad this past year. I think some of these guys we brought in from Europe aren't necessarily the best guys. They were just available bodies at that level. I think you've really got to run the gamut. I think you need a uh, forward in the first, but I think you need a couple forwards and a couple defensemen. You've got to really use your pick to spread all around the yeah. ice. Well, we have five picks right now. I think three forwards, two defensemen, and just whatever's right at each pick. But yep. like the end I goal th being that total. My gut says we're going to have seven picks in this draft. Yeah. I wouldn't be shocked. The Flames do have I don't think the we... Flames do have too many bodies, so like just organizationally. Um so, you know, like you could recoup a pick from trading stone for like a fourth or something like that. So, you know, it, like there's plenty of options available. It's just a matter yeah. of waiting and seeing. So, yeah, I, I think you know, and you're right. The Flames last year did a really good job with their picks, and I think for me I don't write off with this team the sixth and seventh round picks like I used to. Yeah. You used to go, oh, it's the sixth and seventh, doesn't matter. It's almost like, you know, just pick a name randomly off the list and draft that guy. We've seen this team, like you said, make some good depth choices because they've had to, because they haven't had top picks. Not to say that those guys like Tulola are going to become the next star of this team, but they're good picks for where they're picking. And because of that, I think, you know, even looking at this seventh round and this fifth round pick, I'm excited to see what the team's going to yeah. do. Yeah, and, you know, if you find, you know, another guy like Mathias Emilio Pedersen or Zav Garovny, awesome. And that's all you need to keep doing. And you get more darts in the board, you might end up hitting a home run because, you know, like... It, you look at other teams that are successful, like Pittsburgh didn't expect Gensel to be there and be as good as he is, and or Point with Tampa or uh, Palat with Tampa. So, you know, it just depends. I, I think if you look at it, I would almost take the, I call it the, the Daryl Sutter approach, but I think in the fifth and sixth round, I would probably this year go for size over skill that late, especially with that seventh pick. I think looking at some of these guys we were talking about early, and I'm just scanning through the top about 70 picks here, a lot of smaller guys. Um, I mean, we saw that with Kanzig and it didn't work out as well, but I think with that seventh round pick at least, I'd probably go for the size over the skill. Yeah, it just depends on what's on the board. And, you know, if there's somebody that's notable, like I, at, when you're getting into the sixth and seventh round, it's like, oh, uh, does this guy know how to play hockey at all reasonably well? And if that's the case, like Zavgrovny or Pedersen, awesome. If not, then, you know, oh, well, you just don't re-sign him like D'Artagnan Jolie. You know, it's not a big deal. 
Yeah, and it's it's totally a gamble that plays, right? I mean, we're not angry if our seventh doesn't pan out, um, but if it if it does, it's a bonus. And people always think of some of the picks that Detroit's made or other teams where that seventh has become a star. That's really you know your one in your once in franchise history. Yeah, and that's how you win Stanley Cups is by having one of those guys turn into a real dynamite impact player. And yeah. you know we've seen that with Gaudreau. You know it's. Well, and I feel like the Flames are in a better position now because they seem to put more, ever since Feaster, I guess there's one good thing we can say about Feaster, it's, I think Feaster really got us looking at U.S. college better than we were, and I think those are some of the players we'll see this year in the late rounds, and I think that we're doing deeper European drafts now than we were in the past as well. So... I, I think the U.S. college thing, though, when I look at it, I mean, Feaster took Jankowski, and everyone's like, what the heck? And we've done well with U.S. college since then, but barely ever drafted them in the handful of years before that. So I really think that that's, uh, that's really helped us. Yeah, you have to... Is that U.S. college game? You have to go digging for talent. You can't just go, oh, well, this guy plays in the Ontario Hockey League. He is awesome. You know, like, it, that's not the yeah. way anymore. <laughs> you need to really cultivate from here, there, and everywhere. But good year for the OHL this year. If you look at the number of guys they have in the top, it's it's going to be a good year for them. Oh, yeah, league. I agree. But, you know. Uh, Some people are saying it's probably the best OHL draft in our lifetime. Yeah. Wouldn't be a surprise. So, um, outside of those guys, like I said, I don't have a lot to say besides just make sure that we're picking quality players. And I don't, I don't want the Flames to lose picks. I think we need at least five picks. I don't have to be the five we have now. But I think we need at least five picks in this draft because we need to replenish the cupboard. Yeah, uh, our cupboards are very empty. I think for some of the empty. players like you're, and I think you know as much as we're going for a Stanley Cup run, you you ha- you can't be Detroit where you have no you had no prospects for years. You've got to maintain the balance between the two, and I think for some of those positions like the Taylor Hall type position, that's a deal that could be done after July first if you want to either through free agency or trade. I don't think you have to give up draft assets this year to do that. No. And uh, frankly, like the flames, like the number one goal of rebuilding is amassing talent. And they've done that. You know, we're one of the best teams in the NHL. Now it's a matter of figuring out which assets are the important and key ones that are driving your success. And then surrounding those guys with what you need. And, Mm-hmm. It, now this is the interesting part of the developmental phase is okay the flames fell flat on their face this year let's fix it and it'll be interesting to see well, what I they think, do i think in the past we didn't have a lot of assets that we wanted to trade so we had to trade picks now if we want to make a trade we have the assets we could yeah move. like would i be pissed if the flames traded sam bennett yeah but if you got say you know, either Kadri or Taylor Hall in that trade, you go, yeah, that sucks. But on the other hand, and, you know, and that's going to be a, with a lot of but possible that's, trades. That's also not a deal I think you would need to do on the floor no. either, though. No, of course not. Just to, everything depends. Um, yeah, and, and there's still a few free agents who I don't think we'll see a big deal like that on the floor because I think this year more than others – there's a few free agents who are still unknown. And I think teams are going to want to try and take a crack at those guys first before you make an NHL player for NHL player deal. Yeah. Uh, like I, I would almost rather instead of going after hall and trading, say the first, and we'll talk about this more, you know, in our free agent preview episode, but I'd almost rather keep the first keep Bennett and try to get Simmons as a free agent. Oh no, 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 no. Simmons is done. Uh, I, yeah, he was horrible with Nashville and he was bad with Philadelphia this year. He's basically done. He's Milan Lucic right now. Like, uh, we've got James Neal. Yeah. We don't need a second one. Like I, I really liked this player that Simmons was, but he's not the same guy Mm -hmm. anymore. We'll see. I don't think he's a top six, but we'll, we'll talk about it when we get there. I don't think he's top six. I think if he takes a pay cut, he could have a a place in this team. Yeah. But we'll see. Yeah. Um, so, Matt, you're going to watch... Do you have NHL Network? Are you going to be watching the rounds two through seven? Uh, yeah, I will. 
So for those that haven't seen it before, you probably watched the Friday Night Draft. It's quite the show. You see Bettman go up. He gets booed. He introduces everybody. Then you see all all 31 picks get made on the stage. If you watch two through seven, they don't even go on the stage. I don't know why they keep it set up. It's really just the GMs at the table uh, making their pick over the loudspeaker. Yeah. Do they even make the pick or do they call it and somebody they else call makes it the pick? In. And then a, the voice of God makes the pick yes. through the arena announcements. So, so and so from um, this team has been selected by insert name of team here. You don't even get your picture on the stage. Often it's just the picture with the GM right at their table with the donuts and everything on the table. Yes, so. and then they say, so and so team, you're on the clock. And then 60 seconds later, it's that pick is taken and so on and so forth. So I was trying to look it up. I know in the NFL, they've had guys that have missed their spot uh, being on the clock. I can't find a time in the NHL that's ever happened. I do believe it has once. I think LA did a few years ago. Something okay. like that. A yeah usually most teams are prepared for that kind of stuff uh, the only yeah. way that would happen really is if uh you're talking trade and oh crap <laughs> so well and even then hopefully i mean you've got enough assistant gms and stuff who hopefully would get you going ahead of yeah. time because i don't want to trade for your pick that i just missed yeah, exactly like if it was me i would say that at that point we're the trade's over i don't want your pick yeah. so um, but anyway, enjoy the draft, Matt. I think that's probably all we have to talk about. Yeah, and it's episode, one of those. Anything else you want to it's chat? one of those things where we just have to kind of wait and see how the next week and a bit develops, and wait and like everybody else, and see exactly because we know things are going to happen. Because you don't fall flat on your face like the Flames did and not make moves. It's just figuring. Yeah, I out. just want to preface to everybody. I don't think we solve our problems at the draft. I think this is a longer term solve that we'll see part of on July 1st, part of throughout the summer. Like I think if you're going into this draft expecting we make some big moves and all our problems are solved, you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. I'm expecting some stuff to happen, but not all at once. No. And I think, like I said, this year is a year that they, I, I think they're going to want to wait and see how chips fall in the first. I think there's enough players that are going to be available, especially on the goalie side that you might even be better to save your assets, wait for somebody not to get the free agent they want and then jump on yeah. it. So, but yeah, I think we'll see at least one big thing happen, but I'm not expecting, I'm not expecting a deal as big as what we've seen in the past. Like the past two years, you and I've said, Whoa, like, you know, that was a huge deal for the flames. I'm not expecting that this year. I am, but we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, I'm expecting see a Brody. Hopefully, it'll give us. Yeah, I'm expecting Brody to and something to get traded. So, see, I'm expecting Brody to go, and I think we'll get like a second and a middle six guy. Yeah, I'm expecting a second line forward or s equivalent. Well, hopefully, you're right. Yeah. Well, let's find out what happens this weekend. Uh, by the time the show comes out, it'll be this weekend. And then we'll be back after the draft to talk about what did or didn't happen. And also to look forward to that free agency day on July 1st when the Flames will hopefully finish whatever shopping they need to do. Yep. Uh, before we before we go, I want to remind everybody it's still open and will remain open for probably another week, and that's our listener survey. Uh, you can go to firesidechat.ca slash survey. We'll also have the link in the show notes. Uh, this is a survey that we do every year. It helps us understand what you guys like about the show, maybe what you want to change about the show, uh, things you might say, hey, I'd like it if you guys did this differently next year. It's our way to get feedback from you guys. And totally optional to do. At the end of the survey, if you leave us your name and your email address, we'll actually enter you into a draw to win a prize pack with some flame stuff, some fireside chat stuff, um, and one person will win that. So if you don't want to leave your name, that's cool. If you want to leave your name, uh, we'll make the draw during the summer for that. So check it out. We love your feedback. Again, that's firesidechat.ca slash survey. So, Matt, enjoy the draft, and hopefully you're right. Hopefully you make a big deal and get this thing rolling. Yep. As always, go Flames, go. Go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.